And let's get the show on the road here. Ah. Welcome to another Evolution Hour. And there's the clickety clacks and obsolete technology that I grew up with as a child. My, my. And there's TortukanWordPress.com, Troubles in Paradise, the methodology of creationism, where RJ attempts to vaporize every creationist on the planet, one bloody source at a time. A big job, but I'm jolly well going to try to do it. So, anyway, um, had a little bit of a mess trying to get... Uh, oh, Psy Strike's in the in the call. Oh, hi there. Hi, Strike. Hi, Psy. Uh, the... Um, a lot of things going on the thing. I had a trouble getting some stuff going because there's some little side issues involved. I'm hoping that uh, Matt Heron will be in the side commentary thing. I was trying to give him some information on this. Um, we've got a bunch of things going on with uh, a new posting that um, Jeffrey Tompkins did with uh, criticizing Matt Heron's new uh, multicellularity paper. And there's some stuff on laterites and geology. And then, of course, the continuing Sagath of contested bones which i'm doing source by source by source for those of you who are new to this uh and those who are not you'll be bored as i explained again that um a uh, an anti-creationist wanted to look through this book came out in 2017 and uh, didn't want to do it himself so he offered to send it to me and as an impoverished scholar i say hey great uh so there i have the book and and i'm doing a source analysis on it so uh, i'm analyzing what sources are used it's got like footnotes and everything you know real live little footnotes in there on the bottom of the page the problem is there's no bi bibliography no index so finding particular bits of information is not well done um they're currently i'm currently in the homo naledi chapter which i've been analyzing for the last few weeks and their argument is that naledi is just people that somehow or other have some unusual characteristics and they've been kind of parsing their way through the data field on this. In fact, uh, Homo naledi is regarded as really basal and there was some argument as to whether or not it really might belong over in the Australopithecines, but the current view still sticks it as Homo naledi. And um, it's got um, a mixture of features that make it interesting not necessarily the direct ancestor of human beings but it's got some it's an ar arboreal creature that's bipedal uh, as which is typical of australopithecines it's got some um uh, still pretty small brain size uh and some uh, very more flat-footed uh, uh, adaptive to upright walking than uh, um, the typical australopithecine so it's an interesting mosaic of features but it ain't a human being. It's not Homo sapiens. And it ought to be a dead giveaway that nobody's classifying him as such. Um, I'm on my own here, so I got to look over period. Oh, Matthew Heron is in there. Yes, he's having dinner. I just saw him. Yes, he had a camera feed on. He was feeding the dog and all of that and suddenly realized, oh, I'm on I'm on his camera feed. And so, whoop, shut that down. Anyway, uh, uh, Brian Stevens says, what kind of creation is to lit allow sources? No, that there's a, a branch. The, the higher echelon creationists are just agog with footnotes. Rupi and Sanford are not exactly live wires on this. Sanford's book is pretty sparsely documented, his uh, genetic entropy book. And this one here is very sparsely documented. It's only running about two sources, less than two sources per page, which is pretty thin. And an awful lot is authority quoting and about half of their technical literature is misrepresenting the content. So it's not, it's not looking good here. Uh, but when you look at somebody like uh, Jeffrey Tompkins, who we'll be, we'll be discussing shortly, uh, and um, uh, Andrew Snelling, uh, the creationist geologist, those papers they do tend to be just festooned with footnotes. They're heavily documented. That can be laborious to go through from a source methods direction, but ultimately useful because you're seeing just what's under their eyeballs and how whether the sources are young or old, or are they following up on technical literature? Or are they using them for authority quoting? So all of that stuff um, fits in with the analytical approach where you're looking at how the argument is constructed. Um, Brian Stevens says footnotes can be circular and creationist lit leading from B to B. Oh, there's an awful lot of incestuous scholarship. Yeah. Uh, that, when you get down to the mid-range stuff that pops up in Acts and Facts, the ICR uh, magazine, or in the Answers in, um, uh, in Genesis postings, there's an awful lot of incestuous scholarship there, where most of the footnotes are to their own side, telling you why their side is correct. 
But uh, from a methods point of view, I'm interested ultimately in seeing when they bump into the external data field, because now we can observe how they're processing information regarding those external sources. And if they're misrepresenting the data, which Rupert uh, is doing all the time, it's functionally Rupi, because Sanford pretty much admits in the preface that um, uh, Rupi did all the heavy lifting. He was the one that was arranging the scholarship. So every goof up that I encounter is likely Rupert's fault, no, Rupi's fault. Uh, we've got, uh, oh, Matthew Heron says B to B, biocomplexity to biocomplexity. That's a, that's a little, I, I know the in-joke, biocomplexity is the little journal that the intelligent design movement runs. It looks like PLOS, the, the public li uh, library of science format. They've got everything looking the same in terms of font style and the way the abstracts are constructed and everything, you know. So if we look all like uh, the, the PLOS one and PLOS biology and all of that, it must mean we're doing science. But it's very fun to watch all of those. Uh, the, um, oh, hi, insects. Uh, and insects is one of my patrons. Uh, thank you very, very much. Sure, I'll be uh, having my usual thank everybody on the uh, uh, middle of the show for all the people that have been helping me muddle along uh, bit by bit. It was a little bumpy ride getting on started. I was trying to do uh, umpteen things at the same time and send out links to everything because I definitely wanted Matthew to know uh, about this particular show because we're going to be discussing his stuff uh, in this and the reaction that Tompkins has on it. So we got uh, a lot, a lot of things to go in. I, I plead guilty right up front to being an old fart who is just a guy in a sweater talking on the show in his den. And I'm not fancy uh, graphics. I don't have the sophisticated openings and all the things that pop up, nor do I do the show pre-recorded so that it's then put up as a thing after the fact. Um, it's live. You're seeing this right now and I'm winging it as I go because I like that interactive feedback. I like to have questions from people. That's why when I bring people in, I put uh, links up on things. Uh, uh, haven't heard back from Jackson Wheat. He apparently is not uh, available because otherwise we'd be giving some up bits on the uh, Heron matter, which by the way, that's such a juicy example. I'm putting it into the new uh, Rocks book. There's a section in there on um, uh, multicellularity, and I slipped that stuff in rather beautifully because it uh, relates to that. Anyway, um, I put, as, as usual, the, the cardinal rule of source methods is follow the damn sources. And so although there are a lot of sources I'm able to get access to, if I can't pull a full link up on it so you can follow too, I don't do that. So all the sources that I put up in the description uh, section of the text are a full link so that you can find the full text available. And it may not be for everybody to follow up every single lead, but it's there. So you don't have to take my word for it. Don't take my word for it. You don't need to take my word for it. You can look for the science itself. And, and if anybody comes up with material that's relevant to the points that I do, uh, then by all means, bring them up in the comment section after the video has been posted. I get some occasional creationists that are popping along. There was one uh, Mac Mac who has been snarking at me for a couple weeks. And uh, it turns out he's somebody I'd encountered on Twitter as Chris from Texas or Mac, C-Mac or Chris. He's gone to, he, he bounces from one screen name to another as uh, he flips along because he's um, um, a, um, a young earth creationist who believes in Nephilim giants and all of that. And he's uh, uh, pretty sloppy and he was getting really annoying at one point. I decided to block him which is unusual for me. I don't block many people uh, unless they are um, um, very annoying. But anyway, he materialized under a, a yet another name in uh, uh, the uh, field. Well, the one thing I try to do in all of mine is I'm me. I got my mug out. I don't hide behind an avatar. I don't hide behind an, a, an ubiquitous screen name. I'm RJ Downard. I've been RJ all the time. I've got Downard on there. There's no secret who I am. I'm not mythical. And uh, oh, I don't know whether or not, if, if there's any glitchings up on the this feed today, there may be, I've been seeing some picture uh, freezings occasionally. If there's any problem on that, again, I plead extenuating ignorance and uh, my apologies. I'm amazed any of this works at all. I mean, there are people all over the planet, theoretically, that can watch all of this stuff. And here I am in Spokane. Anyway, uh, um, uh, Cork says, I love having to explain to creationists that we don't have all the answers yet and probably never will, but we're working on it. Uh, oh, oh, uh, now, now wants to be a moderator. By gosh, yes, indeed, uh, that uh, I at least have control over the wrenches. I find that there are a lot of places that I go into in some of these debates that um, uh, turn out uh, that way. They don't give me a bloody ranch. 
So I feel like positively uh, a minuscule here. Uh, so anyway, yeah, people can then put up with wrenches. They can put up the um, uh, uh, information on uh, of sources that they may find, and they can link to that deck because you can't put an HTML uh, or a, a web link up if you don't have moderator rules. So those are the things that I've been figuring out on that. Anyway, um, the upshot of um, the Rupee and Sanford argument on humans is that there's not humans that are all AP things and they may be a separate kind and how many there are, they don't really care. And then there's us and humans are a fixed kind and nothing can ever interfere with that. And anything that looks kind of close has got to be sucked like a vacuum into the human barrowman. So Neanderthals and uh, the Flor Floresiensis uh, oh, homo uh, ones, the little teeny hobbits that were found, um, they've got to cram them in on the human side no matter what. And a lot of the, the bits about this hip structure that they're saying are just variants on human beings are by dragging in the floresiensis fossils that there are a small number of paleoanthropologists who are trying to argue still that they're uh, odd human beings with Down syndrome or something like that. But most of the technical work that's been done by people are saying, nah, no, this isn't consistent with it. We have too many examples of um, uh, the bones now from there that, that what, all of them suffer from it? No, this is not an isolated phenomenon. And so they are still classified as a separate species in our genus and more with traits of remnant Homo erectus, which means the whole argument that Rupi is trying to do where they're trying to drag those little Floresiensis pieces over as ways to say, well, Homo naledi has some things that's like Homo floresiensis, and that's just a human being. So that, that means that they're human beings too. No, it's a terrible argument. Anyway, uh, insects, of course, so I got into a conference call with Behe a couple of days because I pre-ordered Darwin Devolves. It wasn't very interesting. The book or the conference call? Um, that um, I've never had a direct interaction with Behe. I've had some email exchange with, with him way ago on way when I was trying to find out what the hell does he think that was going on with whales because he used to bring them up in some of his uh, undergrad lecturing when he was doing that at Lehigh, uh, Lehigh University. And um, um, I wanted to know what did he know about that ever since? In fact, in the firing line debate, uh, William Buckley had uh, where the intelligent design movement was at, up full swing. It was Behe who brought up this issue of whale fossils that he gave to Philip Johnson, who was the one that actually brought it up during the discussion, but it didn't actually get anywhere. Uh, they never actually resolved it in the show. But Behe has no interest in whales, and uh, he's not a paleontologist. He has zero interest in them. And so I found that out at the time. Uh, it was not a surprise that he didn't care a rat's ass about it. He was just using them as ammo because, oh, well, here's stuff you don't seem to understand about stuff. And it's a, it's a terrible argument. Uh, Insects, who says, the uh, the conference call wasn't very interesting. I haven't started reading the book since I've been focusing on Darwin's doubt. Yeah. Um, uh, what you might want to do, Insects, on Darwin's doubt is get another book that's directly on the Cambrian explosion. Uh, the um, a new book by Irwin that I just got is a handy one, but there's an awful lot. Or stuff online and kind of bone up a lot of that. Uh, you could look to see what I covered about the Cambrian explosion in three macroevolutionary episodes where I've got all of that, or uh, that's all available, downloadable uh, PDF in there. Where I, I'm, I'm still quite proud of that. There are, there are a few minor quibbles that I would have to have in revising that section, but overall the major issues are there, which is how many of the phyla don't have a fossil record, like half of them, uh, that of those who are, if they're soft-bodied creatures, they're invisible without a lager statin deposit, which really brings up the problem of how to identify what was going on before the big Cambrian explosion. Because you need to have this rare preservation thing to get details to tell what the hell's going on. What is a soft-bodied trilobite going to look like? What is a protochordate going to look like? When the chordates that are in there are only like half an inch long, uh, and um, they're little wiggly things that are invisible without a lager statin deposit. So, uh, um, it do uh, do that in sex by having some of the background information and go through his sources. When he brings up a technical point, have a bookmark there back in the references. And to the extent that's possible, most of the technical papers that he'll be citing are available. And make a point of looking to see what is really old when he's suddenly citing a paper that's from the 20th century, not the 21st. 
you should go, that's odd, and look up the taxa, find out what they are. The things that I found that were kind of shuffled to the side are how primitive the chordates are in the Cambrian. Um, I pointed out this to Casey Luskin when I bumped into him once uh, at a lecture that he was giving in Seattle, uh, that the chordates that were showing up uh, in the Cambrian are exactly what evolutionists were expecting them to look like. They look like lamprey larvae. They're extremely rudimentary. And they, they're showing a great variety. So a lot of stuff has been going on in their group. Uh, and how long that had been going on is still a legitimate source of debate, but they're not modern chordates. They're very basal and what were to be expected in the Cambrian. And uh, Luskin didn't want to think about that. And uh, Steve Meyer certainly didn't want to think about that. And I don't think he does that anywhere in the book. And then you've got the chel the chelicerates, the spiders and scorpions and horseshoe crabs. Look for them buried in the notes because that's one of those phyla that I point out in uh, three macroevolutionary episodes are identified in the Cambrian only on evolutionary grounds. The, the, the chelicerates in uh, the, I keep on mispronouncing the chelicerates in the um, uh, Cambrian don't have the little chelicerate, the little things that are distinctive of their phylum. These are really early group that's branching off into the forms we see later, much, much later. So the only, if you're an anti-evolutionist, you have no call to call them chelicerates. These are critter X that belong to what kind of a kind or phylum or uh, a barrowman, what, what do they think is going on? You'll discover, I suspect, that you're never going to find out what Steve Meyer thinks any of these things are or if any of them are related to anything. Is anything alive today descended from the chordates in the Cambrian? Does Meyer think that? No, you, you, there's no model there. There's no there there. So there we go. And um, uh, oh, side strike. Oh, you're casting RJ to my TV. Okay, there we go. That's a terrible thing to do your, your television set. <laughs> anyway, um, because I probably want to discuss a bit more about the side subjects here, I'll go and do my shameless plug really early. And uh, remind everybody about our, my patrons and say how grateful I am that everybody has done this and how I finally figured out how to make Patreon connect up so that I was actually getting the patron money. Uh, it took me quite a while to do that. So there we go. And we want to share. And my computer is still slow as molasses at the point, but some of these little things has been bulky. Maybe I've got too much crap loaded into it. What can I say? Come, 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 come. We're waiting. I'm waiting to share. So sorry. Uh, de -de 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 come on, come on. The reaction time here is like a sloth today. And um, speaking of sloths, I was particularly delighted with Matt's description in um, um, the uh, piece about um, the uh, biogeography issue. I think it was in Matt's piece. Let me take a look here while I'm waiting for that connection to link up. Um, or maybe it was Nathan Lent. Sometimes I look at far too many things and wonder. Yes, I may have been. It may have been in a different um, piece. Uh, let's see. And um, yeah, because it's all a multicellularity. I think it may have been a different uh, connection. That um, I follow quite a lot of blogs and people pointing out things, and I'm still waiting to do the bloody share. It's just seizing up altogether. Let's try that again. We're getting bad reaction times here, kids. Maybe the internet is slow and everybody is on it and it's clogging stuff up and interfering with things. I'm trying to get up my... I am attempting to do a screen share and the button is being really, really slow. So I've got to fill airtime. That's one thing I do learn from the theatrical experience. There's nothing more appalling then sudden silence. And so these people that will discover that some glitch has occurred and they start trying to focus on it and don't remember that everybody listening to the show is suddenly going, what the hell's going on? So I, I bear that in mind. So while I'm waiting for my share button to actually activate, I will attempt to continue with the, uh, the matter at hand. And um, I'll get out of the way first the bits about um, the, um, uh, the geological stuff from um, too many papers, too many papers. <clears throat> uh, this uh, 
as I go through the technical literature and these various anti-evolution claims, uh, when I encounter some juicy new little bit, that's what I tend to put up on the um, evolution hours as follow-ups. Uh, and it can be stuff from the intelligent design movement. It can be material from the young earth creationist movement. It's got a lot of different uh, venues. But the one that I put up uh, happened to be a thing from Sean uh, Doyle that was uh, in a 2017 um, Journal of Creation article. Do laterite uh, soils take millions of years to form? There's a particular branch of soil formation that particularly involves iron deposits that... Um, um, it was an issue about how long they take to form. And Doyle was pouncing in on this to suggest that they can form super duper fast and that they're actually formed in the flood. Well, no. And uh, I tracked down all the various technical papers. He didn't have a hell of a lot of them, as you can see, uh, when if you go to uh, look at the link that I put up. There's not a huge amount of technical literature in it. Um, I think he's got a whole sourcing of about one, two, three, four, five, about half a dozen, and then a bunch of creationist literature. But I then did some follow-up and put a linkage up to a 2015 paper, which uh, theoretically, or 2014, which theoretically he could have known about because he was writing in 2017 on soil development over millennial timescales by uh, Sauer et al., which has illustrations and tells about all the difficulties and pitfalls of working things out that they have to deal with, whether or not they're in an arid environment or not, and how much soil could be blown in and therefore uh, skew how the processes are being dated post hoc and all that. And it's a very nice informative paper that gives you a contrast between that and what's going on with um, our uh, little pal. I am not getting my bloody share button in here, so this is not working at all. And uh, I may not be able to share it, in which case let me be uh, completely craven and do this the old-fashioned way, which is to thank my patrons. Uh, we are just about the half of the show. So there's my uh, Hendrel and Eric Raleigh and Keith Carden and Fino and Brad and Ralph and Meet Convert Me and Pologia and Soar and Direwolf and Durenku and James Fitzwater and Kyle Frick and Nana, who is in the uh, feed as we speak, and Staggles and Surus and uh, Todas Real and Eat Meal and Stephen and... Uh, uh, um, Marigale and Insects Are Cool, who are also in the feed, and uh, Daniel Johnson and Bo Holbo and uh, Alex Stone, Paul Williams and Zeshi, and some legacy patrons, Jen and John and Andrew and Mona and Sun and Everett. Uh, thank you enormously. I, it looks like I'm not going to be able to put the visual up on that, uh, so uh, my, uh, my bad. Uh, but nevertheless, your names are there, and I'm very happy for all the work that you have uh, done and the confidence that you feel in my work to actually plunk down some money that can actually come through and makes a big difference in being able to keep up with getting like ink and paper, as well as food and other things that make uh, it possible to continue on what's going on in here. So um, the the Patreon link and the GoFundMe and stuff, that's uh, I put up that as well, but that's always in the uh, video linkage so everybody can find that. And uh, um, apparently the uh, Google Hangout is not permitting me to do that little screen share in a convenient amount of time. So screw it. We will move on. And uh, uh, patrons thanked very much. So um, the laterite example um, is that bit about how creationists are trying to cram geology into their framework willy nilly. And uh, anybody that has a geological frame of mind, um, go on and follow that one up and be a beauty on that. But here, the fascinating thing that just jumped, jumped out at me when it hit yesterday uh, was um, the posting that Matt, hi Matt, uh, put up about uh, the, how he was debunked by the Institute for Creation Research. And it's a nice thing having these tendrils and people that I follow because they bump into things that I don't necessarily trigger on that I can then follow up on. So uh, Matt has been involved with our cute little Volvox organisms and other things. And he has also got in, uh, involved with a long range of material with Ratcliffe and others on the um, uh, experimental evolution uh, with uh, the cute little uh, green algae um, that tends to clump together when it's stressed and has predators and the likes. And it turns out with a very specific predator, it not only went into this mode, but it stays there and uh, won't revert back to the declumped thing. 
And that, so this is some of the clues about how multicellularity arrived. And uh, uh, this was such an interesting subject. There's a whole slew of the technical papers that are listed in the link that uh, Matt put up, as well as the material that you can, uh, I have a whole bunch of Ratcliffe's papers anyway uh, on multicellularity evolution in my tip bib. And so that uh, went to a juicy little addition to the new book that Jackson and I are doing. Uh, and there's a little section on multicellularity at one point in one of the chapters. And I thought, ooh, I'm going to add a little section pa paragraph on because it had a fallout. So the paper that um, has just appeared, uh, De Novo Origins of Multicellularity in Response to Predation, free, open access. I put a link up to that so everybody can follow on there. Uh, and uh, then the, uh, checked on the various other papers that were involved in this uh, uh, Boyd's uh, paper and the thing even on um, uh, polemoloids. I also put the linkage up to uh, Jeffrey Tompkins, uh, his algae multicellular evolution study debunked. That's at ICR, Institute for Creation Research. And... Um, if you're not familiar with Jeffrey Tompkins, he's actually a geneticist. And uh, he, I think, comes to the University of Georgia, does some occasional technical work still in collaboration, but he's also got the big axe to grind. And uh, he insists that uh, the human genome is degenerating and that the human chromosome 2 fusion is not legit, that it's a, a, an artifact. And it's there's a whole mass of, of subjects that he has slogged into. And because he has genetics degree, he's got more of a techno file approach to these things. So it's fun to track down his source material. This article was not exactly one of them. It's a light posting other than having this uh, link to Lurling and uh, Beekman from 2006 on these uh, pomaloids, which are the little clumpy part uh, of the uh, uh, green algae. Um, he just cites Heron and then some um, Galusia and uh, some other uh, creationist material. So it's um, pretty thin. And uh, he's essentially dismissing it as not really important, and plus that there was new information involved. And Matt rightly asks, what exactly does he mean by new information? Where exactly is this? And so it, it's uh, a, a fun thing to follow up on that. And it, it was juicy enough that I wanted to have that example as well, because it was in a section where, in fact, we rake over quite a lot of uh, Jeffrey Tompkins' claims, the chromosome two fusion, and he pops up again uh, regarding uh, a genetic entropy and some of the arguments that he's trying to do on that. So he's he's been a heavy gun in the field. And I pointed out to Matt uh, on his website that he should feel honored, in quotation marks, that it was Jeffrey Tompkins that took a side swipe at him and not Brian Thomas or somebody like that. They are the lower echelon master's degree in science field agents that do most of the writing at, at ICR and Answers in Genesis. Um, but they got their heavy gun out there and Jeffrey Tompkins lit India. And that's the best he can do? I imagine Matt should probably be warned that it is probably likely that uh, Jeffrey will go on and do a paper for Answers Research Journal or something like that, um, or Journal of Creation that will be more technical and lengthy. So bear in mind, keep an eye out for that. Uh, this guy ain't gonna shut up. And uh, we can anticipate that. And, and if anybody finds that ahead of me, or if I find it ahead of him, I'll give you a heads up on it, but don't be surprised on that because uh, they, these are serious theoretical issues that are calling into question core problems with creationism. And so they've got to dig their heels in on it. The last thing that a creationist can allow, an intelligent designer the same way, is that multicellularity, the core of what makes plants and animals so distinctive, can be going on in a natural process that can emerge from unicellular organisms. Because that whole thing, I get this trope that pops up. I think Dwayne Gish was one of the first ones to use it. Maybe maybe somebody else had, uh, prior, but uh, that there's no two cell organism or three cell organism, something like. Well, that isn't even entirely true. I think there's some in the Volvox that get into that range. And again, Matt could comment on that one way or another. Uh, let me look over in the field because I don't have somebody as point person in here. Uh, Brian has been putting up some various links and videos. Shell Reptile says, if Dick and Sonia had mouth, guts, and anus, is it compatible with genetic studies done on early divergence of animal groups? Um, that would be big indicators as to what side of the animal life form it falls under. Um, the problem, of course, is that 
Um, we don't have any living examples. For those of you who don't know what Dickinsonia is, it looks about the size of a kitchen floor mat, uh, kind of an oval-shaped thing. I think they're typically about three feet across. Um, uh, maybe some can get bigger. I can't recall whether some of them got larger than that. And I think it's one of the forms that they've signed, found indications in some of the fossils that it was moving, that it was not static, not sessile. I love that little word, sessile. Uh, and that means that it's got to have muscle tissues and it's an animal, not a plant, if it's moving. Ah, Jackson, you did make it after all. Thank you very much. We'll we'll catch up on things um, and uh, in, in due course. Um, immutable destiny is we're, we're talking about the recent multicellularity experiment. Yeah, uh, Heron's work is a, a big field, as I described it in the little blip that I put into the new book, uh, that um, there have been ongoing work before uh, Matt, uh, and his colleagues kind of connected up to this. Uh, Rattling had done work not only on red, on blue, the green algae, but also on yeast and how they had some elements that were leading to the roots of these things. And uh, multicellularity has lots of spin off implications because it connects up with the whole idea of how sex evolved, sexual reproduction, that you have these uh, defensive mechanisms. And so uh, if you have multicellularity developing as a response to predation, and sex developing as a response uh, to parasites as a way of using that system of multicellularity to insulate you from your uh, parasites fast oh. faster than they are. Uh, I, hi, Jackson. I heard a rather interesting, or I've been reading a number of papers on the origin of uh, meiosis recently, which you know facilitates recombination and is the basis of sexual selection. And the papers I've been seeing seem to indicate that uh, meiosis was a response to endosymbiosis, essentially. The mitochondria was giving off, uh, the Ooh, ancestral neat. mitochondria was giving off toxic uh, chemicals before it had become totally... Oh, so they had to kind of separate it out. I wonder if yeah. they're going to find out that mitochondria, because remember, mitochondria have their little mitts on cell deaths and a whole bunch of other stuff. That, that what we end up with with mitochondria is what happened after the cells did their reaction thing to this invader that they couldn't eat up. Yeah, I mean, they, uh, the mitochondria is, is responsible for a lot of apoptosis stuff, like getting yeah. off uh, caspases and uh, cytochrome C and things like that. Yeah, it's given up a lot of its uh, genome, but keeps its little mitts attached to a yeah. bunch of critical functions that make it you can't get rid of me you can't get rid of me right yeah I, <laughs> uh, the papers i was mostly looking at were by uh nick lane at all oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah get uh, uh, give me a post on that at later points to make sure that i got him uh, in the bit thing uh and then i brought up the subject and, and uh, matthew responded about was wondering if there were multicellular organisms in the ocean before substantial amount of oxygen in the atmosphere and yes and uh, so yes like about a, red uh, algae by 1.2 billion yep. years ago, uh, uh, the, the oxygen. Yeah, okay. uh, oxygen was initially. Remember, it was a byproduct that really got into critical mode because those damn cyanobacteria were farting it. So it was just spewing oxygen as a byproduct, and this is a deadly poison. To a, it's corrosive. It rusts stuff, it, and that's when the big iron deposits formed. As all of that iron that was just lying around, not reacting with anything, suddenly had oxygen to get close to, and it rusted the oceans out. Now, eventually, oxygen builds up to the point where it's starting to leak out into the atmosphere. But remember, nothing was alive up on the land except for some bacteria. I, I, I there's still a problematic way to find out how much bacteria was getting up onto the land uh, ahead of animals, but uh, it wouldn't surprise me at all. I mean, you have animal bacteria living inside of rocks. Uh, so uh, they, they invade everything as a habitat. And eventually your plants and animals were developing to the point where they're now able to start expanding out. There's still some problematic evidence that some of the Cambrian fauna were getting out of the deeper ocean and into the upper area. And this is another factor is that oxygen had to build up to produce ultimately ozone to shield the ultraviolet light that made it less fry -y if you tried to get up on land. So there's no coincidence that nothing was going to be going. If you if you went on a time machine back to the Cambrian, you better carry a lot of protective equipment with you because it's not a terribly hospitable environment. You'd probably be gasping for air a lot, and you'd also Some be SPF worried about SPF 50. Yeah, and the SP, yeah because the ozone layer was still relatively uh, dim on that point. 
uh, when those things started to stabilize, things went wild. Plants just invaded and they and they went rampant. And in fact, there's been arguments about whether or not some of the mass extinction things that happened because of that occur because plants are just completely recombobulating things. They're breaking down soil, which is ro rolling down into the oceans and changing the ocean chemistry. There's just a huge feedback loop that's going on that ends with the big Devonian mass extinction. And uh, then things recalibrate again. So that there's, there's stuff we're learning all the time that you won't find out if you read creationist literature. <laughs> Indeed. Quite a lot of it. Yeah, yeah. We've been having a lot of fun going on. Um, I've been staying up wee hours because of course, trying to write two books simultaneously is, is a taxing phenomenon. And uh, because I'm still working on the second Phileas Fogg novel. In fact, I was working on one of the chapters just this morning. Uh, and then I do uh, the material on the Rocks book. And then I'm still prepping all the other uh, material that I need to do for the chapters that I got to write for the Rocks book. And uh, Jackson's ahead of me on this. You're all the way up chapter six. And I haven't got to that point yet. But um, uh, it, it's, a, it's a fun operation because I love this collaboration that we're doing because you see so many things I don't, and I'm hoping that I'm seeing some stuff you don't. And between the two of us, we're really operating at a, very, <laughs> <laughs> a really high level. I, I'm loving the stuff we're generating on this because uh, it's gonna be a kick butt book. And I'm hoping that we can get it all out of the way this year uh, so that it will hit the ground running in that. And uh, it won't have pictures, but it will have the text. It'll be formatted pretty much the same way I did uh, uh, ev evolution slam dunk, uh, where uh, it's thoroughly documented. Uh, it will not, uh, not be using footnoting except for some commentary things, uh, which is something that that's a handy way of, of functionally doing a sidebar in the text. And I can see that there's some utility to all of that. So I'm, I'm, I'm we're, we're all just kind of flogging around, figuring out how to do this. But in the end, the important stuff is the information. And it, it pisses me off that there's so much of a glut of knowledge that's out there that most people aren't aware is there. And then creationists come wandering on the field with their stuff they've gleaned from Answers in Genesis or ICR, and they think that that's the knowledge? No, it, it, um, there's a line from um, uh, Andy Mame where she says, most uh, poor, uh, life is a banquet and most poor suckers are starving to death. Well, that's the case for a lot of people in the sciences. And it has actual political implications because some of the science that too many people are unaware of is climate science. And we're now getting the sting of decades of the research that people in politics weren't paying attention to. And so the scientific illiteracy of uh, them, not only on that, but some of the people in Congress apparently are gobsmackingly ignorant on what nuclear weapons do and are and, and the, the, the details of why you need to do certain things and not others. So policy matters are being made with people who need more data and they should have a love of the sciences. Uh, I'd love to see a time when there were lots of scientists and people with scientific training that serve in legislatures and Congress and be governors of things. Uh, but, uh, and that the po political system is one that expects their leaders to be really knowledgeable in ways that's beyond just light politics or the ability to schmooze. You need to do that to be a good uh, political leader, but you also need to have that science level. And we know uh, there have been people who were scientifically literate before Lincoln was a real science groupie and he didn't deal with it much. In fact, I think he's one of the few, the only president that actually has a patent. <laughs> He invented some particular thing back in, I think, the 1840s. I can't remember what the heck it was on. but, but Was it a vampire slaying device? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think that's part of that, that semi-fictionalized biography movie. Yes. <laughs> Darn. I was hoping yeah. it was a Shotgun X. Yeah, yeah. That's um, um, the... Um, uh, immutable destiny. Mitochondria generally cause apos uh, apoptosis because if they're overstressed, it can cause their DNA to sp uh, spill into the cell. Yeah. What the thing about multicellularity in general is that we don't think of ourselves as a habitat, but we are. And so, even though we have this incredibly complicated um, uh, brainstem up here that thinks it's running things on its own. All this stuff is going on inside of our body that is the result of billions of years of evolutionary development. That is the reason why our cells do what they do. It's the reason why we have the mitochondria do and so forth and so on. 
Uh, Pavlovica says, uh, DC today prefers Chairman Mao style science. A uh, friend is better than an expert. That's, it's always been the case. I mean, there, there has been, scientific illiteracy wasn't invented in the Trump administration. There were <coughs> nincompoops um, that have served in Congress and, and in legislatures and anybody who's familiar with the history, and that was my gig uh, in college, uh, was aware of all of that. That um, uh, we've gone through a lot of these things before. The difficulty and the promise is that the science is advancing rapidly compared to what it was 100 years ago or 200 years ago. But the upside is the availability of it for the common person is vastly greater. Uh, when I think of how difficult it was to get science information, where I was I when I was starting the TIP project, I was initially looking at what books were available in the public library and what I was seeing in National Geographic and Scientific American. And then the science articles, if I had to track them down, I'd have to go to a college uh, that there are nearby and photocopy them. And, and, and how would you know that the article that you really needed that you didn't know about was in the previous month's issue of that science journal that you didn't even spot because you were only looking for the one you were trying to photocopy? So all of that is some of the things that made things slow as molasses. Now because of the internet and the vast amount of the technical literature, including older works and books and other things. I mean, this is just, it can inundate you. You can feel positively overwhelmed with the amount of material you have. And that's why you have to learn the abilities to triage and, exactly. and to, to think about, to home in on what's the important thing and spot the important thing and to track around. And that's a scholarly skill that as an old fart, I learned bit by bit by bit by bit by bit. Um, there, there, a little aside, I don't know whether you caught um, the um, thing on um, uh, non sequitur yesterday with Aaron Ra. On, uh, with, uh, uh, was it? He was going raw after mat? Raw, uh, raw Matt. Uh, the, yeah, um, I, I watched it. It was astounding. Yeah. It, it, was, it was both wonderful and frustrating. Because the thing that was bothering me about it, nobody can match Aaron for data floor. My God, that man is knowledgeable. He's just spectacular. But yeah, I was just absolutely. ranting from the sidelines that I wasn't hearing source methods questions. You're right. And yeah. Kyle, Kyle at one point tiptoed right to the edge where he was about to ask Raw Matt, how did he come to think the thing he just said? And then he dropped it and never pursued it. And none well, of the other ones. I mean, you know, part of it is that it's, you know, it's four people in a chat and, you know, everyone's trying to get their two cents in all at once. And so yeah. it can be a little bit difficult, but you're absolutely right. It was uh, the fun. I love the comment that Kyle made at the end where Matt had been proved wrong on everything he said, and yet he still felt smug enough to go toe to toe with Aaron for what weeks you know, yeah, <laughs> on yeah. I mean, topics. this this was a kid that was just. Uh, my curiosity was, <clears throat> at the end of the show, I still don't know where Matt was getting his data from. I don't know what sources he was relying on, let alone whether or not well, you he was know his fact book check is, it. You know, you can get to their book and see all their stuff, right? Uh, oh, you got to put me a link up for that. I was looking oh. around to try to find what that was, and I couldn't find it anywhere. Okay, so yeah, I'm I'm a, will... I'm a clumsy oaf on that. So put me a link up at, at, on Twitter or in whatever. The side chat can put that up. That would be really great. Yeah, yeah because I... Um, I, I, anything that I can get full text, um, as uh, Jackson and I know full well, that is the worst thing they can ever do is put their material up so everybody can see it. Because the moment they do that, now you can look at their argument. You can assess what sources they're drawing on, what they don't, what they try to do with their sources. And this is not a game they play very well. This is. Well, uh, well yeah, uh, yeah, Standing for Truth and Raw Matt have written like a 600 page document in, <laughs> in Google Docs that is, quote, their book. Mm -hmm. And it is horrific. It, how, seen, how is it on the reference front? Um. God, it, it jumps everywhere from like straight quoting uh, Tompkins and uh, uh, what's his name, Sanford, to just bizarre <laughs> argument, like quote minds and weird arguments. It's it's all over the place. Is it in like a doc file? Yes. It's a, oh, it's that'd a be Google, handy. It's an open. That'll Google be handy doc. because if I can, and, and is it savable? 
Uh, I think you can save the link. It's, it's yeah. Open, see if I if I, I, I want or yeah, well yeah. if theoretically I, I sometimes I do this. I will manually if I am able to copy the text. I will go through and manually. This sometimes takes hours to copy the whole bloody thing off into a doc file so I can actually look at it at my leisure. Because the moment I can do that, I can text search. So now I can look up topics and probe around to see what where they're using their material. Uh, that is also a terribly useful thing. The same thing with PDFs, where you can, you, not all PDFs have the feature, but most have the feature that you can do text link searching in it. So you can look up particular terms and you can look up particular topics and, and the details to try to track around and work your way through it. And in a giant book, if you can't navigate quickly to where you need to go and find out, oh, do they mention therapsids? Let's find out. Boop, boop, boop. Nope, they don't. Ah, well, there's another one now. Uh, um, that independent of whether they have an index, functionally, you have a way of accessing that information. And that speeds up the uh, the processing department. But anyway, on, on the, the, the raw talk, um, I keep on wanting to, to prod people, please, please, please don't forget the source methods floor before the data floor, that it is part of the, it's the reason why the creationist is, is wrong. It's not merely that they don't have the data correct or that they are not explaining the data. It's they have an underlying source methods that is never going to get them to that that they're relying on secondary sources, they don't fact check, that they are uh, authority quoting rather than searching for data, that they haven't really worked out what their model is, and they don't have any standards for changing their mind. Those are really fundamental issues that are methods questions, not data floor questions. And to the extent that um, people who will have discussions with creationists forget that and focus entirely on the philosophy or the data floor issues, they're leaving a giant point uh, uncovered. And uh, that's the thing that I've been trying to go through on, on this uh, source methods things. Let's see what's going on over in the um, uh, live feed in here. Uh, ba -ba -da -ba -da, that would be okay. Uh, some people have put up various links to some of the science material. Uh, anyway, um, the, the important thing about all of these examples that I try to bring up, if you'll notice that some of the discussion that I've been doing on the series is to hold up the creationist and say, here's why they're wrong. And Pelogia does that sort of thing. You do that in the videos of various, although your focus really is on positive discussion of evolution issues rather than uh, so much of the creationism thing. You've probably done more criticisms of creationism in the stuff that you bumped into with me <laughs> than you had before. Oh, oh yeah. That's, that's a, a certainty. i would really only kind of tangentially look at what the creation would say, but with this, it's with with the rocks. It's all about what the creationists say versus how or what the actual literature says. And you were, you were referencing earlier how you can be absolutely inundated with data. That's how I felt about this part that I'm writing right now. I actually had to put it down because I've amassed a bunch of articles mm -hmm. on uh, varves, and yeah. so I. Because I yeah, that's a huge topic as well itself because it, it relates to climatology. It relates to the way uh, that uh, ice crystals relate to stuff and sedimentation things and metamorphic. I mean, it's just huge. Uh, but yet it's it's an incredibly specific discipline that has enormous implications. And creationists have to dismiss it because it connects up with the notion that through these VARs and the same thing with dendrochronology, that you can step your way back to a time frame that's longer than the age of the earth. And well, so the, they can't allow that to happen. The funny thing is, and, and you're absolutely correct, is that VARs also record human history. Mm -hmm. There are sections where you can look at from like the 1900 to 1500. Yeah, and the, yet, the, and they'll say okay to that, but then you the can tell you can tell the the industrial revolution is coming along. You can find when there are volcanic eruptions, they track down the impact of volcanic eruptions that they can calibrate to where uh oh that's showing up over here because the the, the stuff that's coming out of the volcano is so specific. It's a fingerprint, right? Yeah. So it's you know it's funny they'll say you, know, you can use dendrochronology, carbon dating, and radiometric methods, and it's fine within human time scale, but then as soon as it's you know. 10,000 BC to 50,000 BC. Well, suddenly yeah. we can't use it, the same exact methods anymore. <laughs>
Uh, yeah, they uh, well, and it's terribly ironic because some of the the radiocarbon dating that they dispute like mad, some of that it's used in biblical archaeology. Absolutely, that when it confirms the biblical chronology, oh, they're perfectly happy with that, and then suddenly they'll be uh, uh, looking down their nose at it if it dares to suggest that that little shell is actually twenty five thousand years old. Uh, I'll put a little thing again. There's a link at the main site to Evolution Slam Dunk, which is also available uh, in the ebook formats. Uh, but I'm a, a physical print person, so there it is. Uh, I'm extremely proud of the book, it, and it's literally a work that nobody else had written on pulling together all that reptile mammal transition stuff and covering how all anti evolutionists deal with it. And I was gobsmacked that nobody had ever done this before. So that's why I made that the, the focus of the very first book that I came out with to put little large A on the field. And uh, I, I, it's it's obviously a, a, a self-promotion plug to say everybody should have a copy of the book. But I'm very proud of the content of it. And if you want to deal with creationists with an example that you're going to be way ahead of them on fully, you can use this as a brick to knock them with. Uh, evolution slam dunk is it because you'll literally know every possible counter argument that they can offer because you'll I'll, I surveyed all of them and so uh, it, it's too spectacular an example not to use more <laughs> and it's a really good read yeah I, I it's it's it straddles a line if you know nothing about evolution it will get you up to speed on an awful lot of the characters and elements involved and it's also technically there are things where you'll see paragraphs of a pile up of sources. Don't panic with that. It's just listing off things that you can follow up on if you want. Uh, and it's fully referenced in the bibliography in the back. And so if you are college level knowledge, it's not going to be offensive to you. You're not going along. Well, this guy is just like writing at, at a, a blog level. No, Christine Janice, the paleontologist, uh, loved it. And I was, uh, I had to cross my fingers on that one when I found out that she had read the book and, and it was, she couldn't find any mistakes in it. And, and that's her field. She was actually finding stuff where she didn't know about and thanked me for finding out about the uh, Permian uh, mammal poop, uh, therapsid poop that had uh, um, putative examples of mammal hair uh, back in the Permian that she hadn't been aware of because it was in a relatively obscure journal. So I, I felt confident that I could run without the training wheels that I could, I can write material that's rigorous because I'm constantly fact checking my own argument. I'm constantly self-criticizing to make sure that every word that I put down is a fair and balanced representation of the data field. And if somebody has made a colossal mistake as a creationist, it's wrong to imply they didn't. And I think I make a solid case against all these people. Uh, there's one, creationist, I can't remember which one it is on, on Twitter, that's, that bought my book. Thank you. Uh, and is supposedly reading. And he's up, the last time I heard it was up to page 75, which is curious because that's the last page that you can read free on the Amazon preview. And so I'm curious to see whether he ever gets past that because maybe he didn't buy my book and is only claiming he did. I don't know. We'll find out. <laughs> so anyway, um, Let's see what's more on. Oh, uh, Mutable Destiny, uh, Destiny asks, any work on the Aspartate Malate shuttle and the G3P shuttle? I imagine it would have heart, uh, had to evolve once we have multicellular organisms. That's one that I'm going to write down a note on and look up here uh, because I don't have my bibliography up. Um, does that ring a bell for you, Jackson? He said uh, G3P, that's, that's the, what, the, the sugar that's combined to make glucose, isn't it? in photosynthesis it could very well be I, I literally will have to look all the material up i know there's some new work out on um the origin of the citric cycle and prebiotic uh, components of that i've got a mammoth pile up of technical literature whoops let me i'm on my stupid little cable here let's see if i can get it without a mess um i happen to hit like a mother load of referencing to uh, origin of life material that I still have to plow through. But, but, but so far, oh, good gravy. I then file everything in alphabetical order. Let's see if I can find it in here because it was in part of this. Um, prebiotic synthesis of stuff. Um, hmm. the, the field is really amazing how much technical work is going on in an awful lot of relatively specialized journals. <coughs> and... Um, 
Uh, da -da 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 -da. Come on, uh, protein gradients, uh, heat flows. Uh, da -da -da. Um, uh, Hang on, computational exploration of the chemical structure space of possible reverse tricarboxylic acid cycle constituents. And uh, metals promote sequences of the reverse Krebs cycle. That's something that's going on in there. So um, it, it, the field is, is continuously expanding. And it is unnerving when um, I, I'm not at all not confident that within my lifetime, and I'm already an old fart, that they'll be cracking the origin of life problem because the, the, the field has expanded so quickly and the ability to uh, home in on new experimental elements have happened so much that it's a matter of some young kid out there today, uh, man or woman or team of same, are going to connect dots in fresh ways and think, oh, wait a minute, that connected to that with that. Another thing is that people will be thinking more synergistically. Uh, you notice how we mentioned earlier about all these things all happening at once in terms of how sexual reproduction develops and multicellularity and predation and meiosis and that is a, is a huge interacting thing. That's the sort of process that I suspect went on in the original life. And um, insects, it says, uh, yeah, she thinks they'll uh, solve the origin of life in less than 100 years. It may be way even earlier than that, because I never thought I would live to the day when we would know that there are planets orbiting other solar systems. And so there's a, a, an immense field in there. It's also a threshold matter, because like when flight occurred, there were people who were insisting that it was impossible. Uh, Simon Newcomb proved mathematically in 1906 that the, the first airplane would not be able to carry anything more than a cockroach, that there would be that, that the lift to weight problems and that were in, intractable. This, by the way, was three years after the Wright brothers had already taken to the air. So <laughs> maybe- It was maybe, a little bit behind the curve. Yes. Yeah, well, you have to remember the, the, the White, Wright brothers' flights were not well publicized at the time. And for many years, there was a bunch of experimenters out there that were saying, you know, did any? there's a picture that shows this, but I don't know. It could be fake news. And so there was actually a lot of that, that uncertainty about it until the Wright brothers actually brought their equipment out and began to do that. But by the time then that it realized, yeah, this can work, the field expanded very, very rapidly. But up until then, it was thought to be impossible. And yet, theoretically, anybody... It, the, all they needed was a light enough engine. That was part of the, the thing. It was no coincidence that the Wright brothers had a very lightweight engine to work with, that nobody ever built a steam-powered airplane that was effective. Although uh, later on, um, oh, uh, Glenn Curtis took the old Langley Aerodrome that was steam-powered and put a modern engine on it and showed that aerodynamically it was able to fly not terribly well, but not too bad. And so it was entirely a matter of lightweight engines. So if you have a, a sufficiently powerful engine that isn't very heavy, None of the other technology was terribly difficult to do. And of course, the Wright brothers' other great innovation, sorry, me going techno geek on all this. The other great innovation that the Wright brothers did was figure control. Everybody else that was attacking the problem was thinking of lift and power, but they weren't really thinking, how do you steer it <laughs> once you're in the air? <laughs> and they really, uh, uh, Orville in particular, I think, the, the, or the one that died early, um, really was seminal in thinking about how you warp the wings in order to be able to adjust on the fly to the air currents and your interaction with them. And it was a feedback loop thing. Uh, Glenn Curtis then figured, boy, this wing warping cable system is stupid. Uh, let's try ailerons. Let's just flap sections of the wings up and down. And he invented the system that eventually became the standard one on aircraft. Plus, he thought to put wheels on the damn thing. I mean, you're going to have all airplanes launched by catapult. Um, and so that everything just synergized once it was in that case. Anyway, um, we're past, uh, um, just about to the hour on here. Um, I hope, um, everybody that, um, has heard about this, including everybody at Mike Heron's site will go and read his paper and look up the other material that all that technical literature that's alluded to in it and associated with it is really interesting. And, um, it's a, a fascinating thing about how extensive, the issue of how multicellularity developed a long time ago, how the genes for it aren't popping out of the middle of nowhere. Nothing in this process is suddenly kaboom. It's stuff that develops very slowly, 
the the clumping system that would be the thing that is the thing that leads off to other aspects that lead to multicellularity um that itself would have had a long evolutionary history and the researchers are doing all of this and the other issue is that the ones who aren't doing the work are the anti-evolutionists uh i there are some anti-evolutionists who do little snippets of things like um uh, uh, minic uh in the bacterial flagellum he's a minor player but he does work in the field but in the origin of life thing, I literally know of nobody in the anti-evolution biz who does any origins of life research. And of course, why would they? Because they're convinced that life can't originate naturally. So if life did originate naturally, we can virtually guarantee the people who never will figure this out will be anti-evolutionists because they aren't even looking. So there we go. Uh, oh, yes, Matthew, th uh, thanks for highlighting our work, RJ. I, I, I'm absolutely delighted. That's why I, I, you can let, put the word out that every scientist that's in the areas that I bump into in tip, I like to get in contact with. Every time I see one that's on Twitter uh, or has their webpage and the others, I latch on to that because you guys are and gals are acting as um, the tripwires for all that cutting edge science research. And so I follow on Twitter, the people that are paleoanthropologists. I, I follow the ones that are doing um, cellular material and um, cosmological issues and, and every one of these disparate areas because they will be telling us, oh, look at this new paper that just came out, blah, blah. And um, this is a, an interesting synergistic way to connect up stuff that uh, the, the role of science educators, and in my own clumsy little way, I'm trying to perform that function as well, and Jackson and others are in that same area, is that we want to find ways of sharing all of this stuff because it's neat and it's important. And so the more people who connect up in these networks and find ways of saying, oh, look at what I just heard about there, and there's this technical paper. And when somebody says, oh, what about that? Well, here's the actual technical paper link that you can go to and read, or you can watch the summary of it on this. Various levels that you can deal with. Uh, it's really important to, to get that area in and, and find that synergy. We've got the tools. We've got social media. We've got emails and Twitter and Facebook and every other connective road and, and uh, all the different uh, Skype and various ways of doing things to where people like me or any person in the field can make use of these little bully pulpits. Now, one thing we have to do is find ways of, of, of coordinating because if you've got a thousand people all on the air simultaneously, you can't watch all of them. There's too many. And so you, you can become inundated with the glut of things. I'm fairly tactical about how many videos I watch. I prefer text-based information because I can follow that in a synergistic way faster than I am if I have to watch through an hour or an hour and a half or a two hour program to have two or three little tiny blips going. And of course, I, mea culpa, what am I doing here but spending an hour talking about a small amount of material on there? But um, uh, people can be following a variety of folks online and a variety of people who connect up with a variety of people. And then also something that is a practical matter, get in touch. Um, Apologia will contact me on technical issues. Jackson will. I will contact them asking about things. I'll see their material. They will connect up with something else and I'll go, oh, I didn't know about that. And that will research that and I'll find something else and I'll let them know about it. So <clears throat> We can synergistically up our game, even though I am not watching every video that exists. They're not watching every video exists. Neither one of us are reading every technical paper that ever existed. And yet we're moving the material along so that the net effect of all of the people that watch all of us separately are connecting up with more and more information that way. And if that makes sense, it does to me. Uh, this is one way, I think, that we can collectively work together better and better and better to outdistance all of the wooists, all of the creationists, all of the anti-vaxxers and all the silly people who are defective in their method, limited in their information. And the thing that they've been able to play off of is the fact that too many of their opponents have not been as fast on the draw as they need to be. Well, we don't need to worry about that. We can be faster on the draw to where we're ahead of them on everything. Let's do it. Okay. Well, that's enough for me. And I'm, I'm a little past the hour on here. So I will shut down for this next. Uh, and we will see you next week with yet more Evolution Hour 
and the ongoing world of how creationists suffer from cranial blockage of the rectum.